Um, we're going to do, we're going to talk on compost tea, compost extracts, and we're, it's in a general context of brewing microbes, brewing other microbes. So we are, we are going to um, cover this issue, and um, uh, yeah, I, I, the, in a way I have to be honest and say, you know, there is a lot to this, that, um, we've only got, you know, 40 odd minutes here, uh, there are lots of details, de you know, devil in the detail, etc. Um, I just have to turn my phone off, I've just remembered. Um, uh, so, you know, I have to say, we, I can only really present a bit of an introduction. Okay, I'm going to go through some, some practical steps. So we're going to cover a bit of theory, some principles, and then move into some practical steps on, on, um, on brewing. Um, but still, it's only 40 odd minutes. We could probably do a whole day, a half a day on this, and you know, maybe get outside and look at some brewers that you know, th there is a lot to it. So I, I would encourage you to this, this, take this presentation as an introduction, uh, kind of presenting the, some of the ideas in the bigger picture, um, but do spend some, t if you're really gonna get into this, do spend some time uh, doing some additional reading online through Google, et cetera. You know, there's, there's a few nuances there, but also speak to um, uh, others who are, who are doing it. So let's uh, dive straight into it. So core concepts, I'm just gonna cover some of the whys, the benefits, uh, some of those practical guidelines, uh, application considerations, and um, just some kind of final summary thoughts there. So uh, I'll, I'll tease out these different definitions as we go along, but just starting off kind of in the center of the core here, compost tea, compost extracts. Its essence, it is a compost water combination. That, that's kind of the, the foundation, the beginning point where we bring compost and water together and extract out components from that compost. Now, the key thing we are looking to extract out is the living organisms, those microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, etc. Um, but sure, we do also get out. We we do also extract out some soluble nutrients, uh, some minerals, uh, but also some other soluble organic compounds, some kind of humic substances, humic related compounds that may come out of that compost. So that is your three components that you're extracting out. But really the core, the point of a compost tea is not really for the nutrients, it's not really for those humics, although they play a role, uh, really the core thing we're extracting out is the living organisms, the microbes. And okay, that solution then, then can then be applied to the soil, it could be to the seed as a seed treatment, seedling in uh, treatment in horticulture, uh, to the uh, foliage as a foliage spray leaf surfaces, it could also be used as a, a compost inoculant, uh, or to manures and compost, etc. Um, so that's kind of where the various ways and means in which we might then use uh, the, the, uh, the compost tea or the extract. And kind of, well, why would we do that? And well, one of the arguments is to try and counterbalance, you know, some of our quite intensive production practices, which we are now beginning to learn that, yeah, many of which uh, can have a compromising effect on the soil biology. So, okay, too much cultivation, for example, excess cultivation, excess, too much soluble nutrients in the system. Of course, some of our pesticides could be compaction, some of our monocultures, all of these things in various ways and means all contribute to kind of narrowing down that diversity of microbiology in the soil. Uh, so, you know, the point of the compost tea or the compost extract is to try and counterbalance that, to offset that, to restore some, some of the biological function that is a consequence of some of our intensive management practices. Uh, okay, so and one of the key other reasons was to drive nutrient cycling, to, uh, as we've discussed that a lot already in the past few days, uh, and also as a tool for disease management. And I think that's particularly relevant for organic producers uh, who have, of course, less tools in the toolkit for managing disease. Uh, I think it's particularly relevant for those, but there are a lot of uh, conventional farmers who, who use these various um, microbial amendments as well. Now, there are, again, just to kind of paint this broader picture before we drill into the details, you know, there are these two schools of thought, which, uh, you know, some people really lock heads over these ideas. Uh, one being, well, you know, we can really, our focus should be on stimulating and feeding the native organisms, encouraging the organisms that are already there. And I fully, fully support that strategy. I think it makes good sense. And we can do that through some of the techniques that we have discussed already. You know, optimizing soil health, using plant diversity, designing with diversity as a tool, and essentially feeding the soil, feeding those organisms. And, and that is an absolutely sound strategy that we should all be, uh, all be using in our, applying in our production systems. 
Uh, so then there's the other school of thought that says, well, we can also introduce or inoculate these new populations of organisms. And okay, that could be onto the leaf surfaces or onto uh, the root surfaces or into the soil, etc. Uh, as I discussed there. And so for me, you know, the, there are these two kind of uh, paradigms, I guess we could say. And for me, uh, you know, I think there's a place for both. There's a time and a place for all of these things. I think, of course, the broad strategy is we, the key core strategy is let's just encourage the ones that are there and apply good practices. But there may be times that we may need to kickstart the system. There may be specific points in the rotation or particular reasons where we might want to introduce some of the new populations. And I think so, kind of, I think the two of them have a, a play, time and a place. They can work very synergistically together, bringing these two pieces of the puzzle together. I think there is a real synergy there, you know, one plus one equaling three. And of course, they, they, go, they do go hand in hand. There's no point in introducing new organisms into an environment if we're not going to also look after them. So, you know, we have to be actually using the two strategies at the same time uh, anyway, even if we are, think we're just using the one. So, okay, and then we, 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 we're posed with these, this is, again, this kind of tension between these two schools of thought. We're posed with these kinds of questions. Well, isn't there already sufficient biology in the soil? Uh, and, well, is this a natural thing to do? Is it natural to be applying all these microorganisms? Does nature approve kind of, kind of questions? And, and they're really important and, and good questions to be asking. And I think this idea that um, we use microbials or compost extracts to apply them to the soil to increase the soil microbial numbers, yeah, that's not quite right. There, it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, there is a vast greater number of microbes already in soils compared to what we apply. That's absolutely true. But people who kind of use that argument are not fully really understanding how these kind of products uh, or extracts and things are used. We don't use them to increase, change the soil, to increase the soil population. We're using them as targeted uh, inputs right around that seed. Uh, we're trying to put some of the biology around that seed, around that seedling, around that root system, and let those organisms grow with the plant, grow with that root system in that rhizosphere. It's, and, and sure, they're going to change the dynamic there in that space, in that row, but they're not necessarily going to change the, the whole soil microbiome. It's not really how we should be thinking about them. It's not how and why we use them. But they can be very targeted as a seed treatment you know, around those developing plants. So yes, there's already plenty there, but there can still be beneficial uh, benefits in, in kind of steering the microbes that develop around that root system. Uh, and I'll come back to some examples of that. And you know, some people think, well, well, again, is this natural? Do we want to be putting? Do we want to be applying all these numbers of organisms? And well, the truth is, it is a very natural process for uh, microbes to move into new environments. And this is all part of this new kind of microbiome research that is redefining, as I kind of mentioned yesterday, re redefining how we think. Uh, there's not just microbes all around the root system, which is certainly where they mostly are. That's where they dominate around that rhizosphere. But we know there's now, there's microorganisms that live inside the plant. These are called endophytes. They live inside the plant tissues. Uh, there's, there's organisms who live on the leaf surfaces in the phylosphere. There's a different microbiome community that lives on the flowers, that lives on the fruits. Uh, they are all unique and different communities. And we now know that actually many of these microbes associated with the plant on the phytobiome, as this one is called, we do know that actually they get carried over into the seed. The seed is an inoculant itself. There are microorganisms in seeds. And we're only beginning to understand that seed microbiome and the different species that live in there. And so the plant delivers those. So yes, the plants take the microbiome with them when they release their seed, often to the air, often to the water, etc. So there is an, an, a natural inoculation uh, that happens. And okay, when that seed lands on the ground, well then it interacts with the soil microbiome, all those ones that exist in the soil, these black ones here. And okay, then they interact, then that seed germinates. And sure, what we find is actually there are some species of the microbiome uh, on the soil microbiome that uh, do come up onto the foliage. There is some overlap, of course, as that seed germinates. It's growing through the soil, isn't it? It's, and all the, those leaf surfaces will be colonized by the soil microbiome. But then that seedling, that, that seed germinates, it emerges up into uh, the atmosphere, into the air. Uh, and yeah, it's covered in the soil microbiome. It, it, they come with it. But okay, a lot of those species don't necessarily thrive in there, so they, some of those do decline. Generally, we find that the ones that are associated in the soil stay in the soil 
and those that associate with the, the above ground parts then carry on upwards. So very much so, it is a natural thing for plants to be carrying, taking their microbiomes with them into their new environments when they go and pioneer, etc. And again, it's this whole new field of kind of understanding and thinking about uh, these microbiomes. There's some fascinating things happening. We are starting to measure the uh, and, and measure where you're starting to analyze the microbiome on flowers. And of course, when insects come along, they leave their microbiome. The insect microbiome gets deposited onto the flower. And we can begin to now uh, analyze that and determine which insects have been pollinating those flowers by measuring the microbiome. But you can see insects, of course, are also a vector for transferring microbiomes through into new and different environments and throughout plants. So this idea that, uh, and to get me wrong, I'm, there is a precautionary principle. We do have to be careful about introducing foreign species, alien species, uh, which maybe you know, can escalate um, and cause problems. Of course, I acknowledge that. We, we do need to exercise some of the precautionary principle there. But certainly in nature, it is a very normal thing for uh, microbiomes to be moving around into different ecosystems, very much so. And so the, here's some of these kind of new ideas, new thinking around how we're going to go, kind of manage plants and in their environment going forward. We, we talked about the rhizosphere, that area around the root system. Some of you might have also heard of the phylosphere. That's the microbiome that lives on the leaf surfaces. But uh, there's all of these other spheres that are now emerging, which are unique, which have unique uh, influences over plant health, et cetera, that we're only just beginning to understand. So the anthosphere, this is the micro habitat that associates to the flowers. It's like I just mentioned there. The carposphere associated to the fruits and the fruit surfaces. The colosphere associated with plant stems. Okay, I mentioned the endosphere, that's inside the plant tissues. Um, rhizoplane, this is again part of the, the rhizosphere. But also this one here, the spermosphere, this is the environment around the seed. And actually when the seed, when we plant a seed and the seed germinates, we, we all talk about root exudates and all of this stuff that's going on in the rhizosphere. When a seed begins to germinate, it is also releasing exudates into its spermosphere. And actually, we're now understanding that the spermosphere is critically important. It's a hotspot of microbial activity. And the seed is, of course, releasing these unique ex uh, compounds into that environment to begin this process of colonization, begin this microbial association as it goes through its plant development and goes through, li through its life stages. And actually, we're now understanding that uh, this initial process is um, critically important on all of the other microbiomes that then develop. So this is this concept of something called keystone species. And you might have heard that term used associated with us humans that we call ourselves keystone species. We're making such a drastic uh, impact on planet Earth. Uh, in the microbiological world, it's this idea that, well, when a species moves in first, a uh, particular bacteria, for example, well, it, it changes the environment. It starts to grow, it starts to do things, it changes the environment so that new microbial species can then move in. And this is this idea of keystone species, this is this idea of compost teas, and coming back to my point about uh, we're not necessarily changing the soil per se, but we might want to be inoculating some keystone species, a consortium of microbes who get things started, and as they do that, they lay the path, they lay the foundation for all of the others to come along. So there's all of these kinds of new ideas around this whole microbiome stuff that, again, as I mentioned, is going to involve some serious rethinking about what we already think we know. And I snuck this slide in just because the question came up earlier about the nitrogen fixation, so I just wanted to put this up to you because it's so fascinating. This is this maze that's releasing this mucilage, this root these aerial root exudates in which they are recruiting and they colonize and harbor nitrogen-fixing bacteria within that mucilage. And uh, if some of you may know that uh, the nitrogen fixation process, it, it can only happen in anaerobic conditions. That's why the plant forms the nodules so that it can 
create an anaerobic condition within that nodule. Uh, that's why in, even in those free living fixes, that a lot of nitrogen fixation happens within those aggregates. I showed those aggregates yesterday uh, where we protect soil carbon. Inside those aggregates, we also have lower oxygen and that's where nitrogen fixes start to really uh, thrive because the, those enzymes that they use, as I mentioned, uh, they are deactivated in high oxygen environments. So the point being here is now we've created inside this mucilage an anaerobic environment where we have now categorized all sorts of nitrogen fixing species that live inside that mucilage on those aerial roots and deliver anywhere from 30 up to 80% of that total maize nitrogen requirement. And those are simply genes in that plant which controls the release of those unique root exudates. And all we have to do is transfer through, well, you know, we could do it through traditional crossbreeding. I suppose we could do it through genetic modification as well, if we so chose, but it's much easier. Uh, we can, of course, just cross these genes with some of our current maize varieties, and we can put nitrogen fixing into any plant simply through crossing it with this, an example like this. And it all comes back to the genes in that plant that help to regulate the recruitment of those nitrogen fixes. So if maize can do it, can we, are those genes overlap? Can we put them into wheat, etc.? Uh, not even, not even cross you know, genetic modification. There'll be ways to just breed these things. Wheat will have similar genes for encoding messaging to similar nitrogen fixing bacteria. Like, all of the genes are already out there. We just need to kind of find the right varieties and you know, f foster them and select for them. But instead, all we've been selecting for is yield, yield, yield. You know, these above ground traits that we've been so focused on, okay, disease resistance, some other things too. Uh, but if we select for finding the right uh, genes, then off we go. So I just had to put that photo in there. It's absolutely fascinating. And that's what we were talking about. Okay, I showed that slide already. Uh, it's all about this communication. And therefore, we can use certain microbial products or inoculants, compost teas, to supply some biology here to help support this whole process of plant microbe communication. Okay, now one of the big criticisms is, well, how long do those microbes live if we apply them? And absolutely, we know that many species are not well adapted in those new environments in which we apply them. The native soil microbiota can easily outcompete them. So some of the microbes that we apply actually don't stick around for very long. They may only remain for a few days, a, a few weeks, for example. Um, a lot of studies have showed that. And again, that's used as an argument to say, no, this whole compost tea thing is a waste of time. Those microbes don't even stick around. But again, keep in this mind this idea of keystone species. Well, they, they may be there just to perform a particular function at a particular time. And they're not going to stick around if the plant is not releasing those root exudates, which are the on-off switches. So if the plant moves on into different growth stages and doesn't need those microbes anymore, it's not going to turn them on. It's going to be releasing new on-off switches. So, you know, these thing, these, this is not a static thing. It is a constant dynamic flow of time through growth stages, etc. So again, don't disregard the idea just because they don't necessarily stick around, which often is one of the arguments made. But sure, there's a lot we still need to learn. Uh, there's a lot we can understand better about how to help them, how to support them, how to help them do what they do. So various kind of biotic and abiotic factors, things like the plant age, as I mentioned, okay, that, those genes, I mentioned that too. Microbe to microbe interactions, but other non-living factors too, nutrient, water availability, soil types, uh, soil texture, soil physics, you know, the, the structural component, all of these things, all of these things also have an influence. And again, it's the new microbiome techniques that are gonna help us unpack all of those uh, nuances. <clears throat> now, so from a disease point of view, as I said, uh, very relevant for a lot of organic producers that have less tools, uh, but even for some, con <clears throat> some of you conventional farmers, I know many conventional farmers who, who use these uh, compost teas and extracts, um, and they can absolutely help reduce those that the use of those fungicides. You know, they have a role to play in an integrated disease management strategy. They can still play a role, but traditionally speaking in the conventional model, it's kind of viewed as, well, yeah, compost teas, they're, they're too variable. They don't give consistent results, which they don't. It's definitely one of their weaknesses. Um, but again, <clears throat> new microbiome technologies, analytical techniques is going to help us refine that process. And we absolutely, the evidence is there already. I mean, we know many of the major 
diseases can be suppressed have in the literature in the academic literature in the scientific literature there's uh, many papers on this that have shown that they have various levels of degrees of suppression depending on different crops and depending on different diseases okay but nonetheless the point is the, e the evidence is there we know compost teas can suppress some of the major players for example in a whole range of different co crops okay and okay well you know what, what how much funding how much research has compost tea had uh, directed into it very little compared to <clears throat> how much research funds and effort and endeavor as we put into developing new fungicides i mean it would the, the financial figure would just completely dwarf it so you know give it give it a break sure it's not perfect but uh, the potential is definitely there if we applied some some uh, some of our brilliant minds to this of course there's the potential there to refine and improve that process we have the evidence that they can be effective to varying degrees so let's just work out how to improve that so then moving that that's just kind of some base kind of foundation there i wanted to lay then we move into some of the practicals here so that i have to just draw now that we have to draw the division between compost extracts and compost teas so let's start with compost extract as it says i mean it's really just this is the point it's just compost and water okay we're going to mix these th two things together extract out all the soluble nutrients soluble carbon compounds and those microorganisms uh, that we've discussed a little bit on hopefully some of you went and saw uh, dave beach's session under the microscope and we kind of went through categorizing some of those various bacteria fungi protozoa and nematodes etc and the beauty of a compost extract is it's very low tech, it's very simple. It's just compost and water. And however you want to mix that together, whatever tanks or materials or vessels and things you want to use, just go do it. Mix those two things together. Okay, then we have to screen, sieve that out, screen that out so it doesn't clog our um, application sprayers, nozzles and things like that. But that's the essence. Just mix it with water in any old tank you want to do it in. And that extraction is typically quite short. It could be as quick as half an hour. It could be a couple of hours up to six hours some people do these extracts uh it just depends it just depends there um, there's no set rules on these i have to say i'm going to kind of present a range of um guidelines because everybody does it differently and sure that's one of the weaknesses of compost tea that everyone does it differently so it's hard to get this consistent uh, effects but it's also one of its strengths it's why do we always have to be so uniform you know there can be strength in in, in um, diversity and etc as well so point being also there is no additional food sources added okay during the extraction itself you may add food sources at the time of application so when you're introducing those microorganisms you give them a little bit of a food source to help them establish out in that new environment but you're not adding foods you're not brewing them you're not <coughs> multiplying them like we'll move on and talk about with compost tea it's just simply extracting whatever is there in the compost into the water and then filtering it and using it so the positives of that, it's very quick, it's easy, low tech, small investments. I mean, it's very straightforward. Uh, the negative is typically you would need a bit more compost than what you would need for compost tea. So we might be using as much as 10% compost, so about 10, 10 kgs of compost per 100 litres of water to make a 100 litre extract, which you would typically use that across a hectare. Okay, so that's the principle of a compost extract. Now we could then take that extract and then turn it into a compost tea by adding food sources and some oxygen, which I'll talk about, but we can also just leave it and turn it into a non-aerated compost tea. So this now goes through into more of a fermentation. This moves into an anaerobic process, a fermentative process. And a lot of the literature you'll read around uh, non-aerated compost teas is uh, we'll talk about, well, they are higher risk uh, for disease, uh, they're not as effective, uh, you don't, you're not growing as much microbial biomass, etc. And actually, if you look into the uh, academic literature on this, actually, non-aerated compost teas have been shown very effective, again, to be, to be very effective against, again, a range of different diseases. Uh, they can be, indeed, very effective uh, through the various fermentation processes that they go through, and then that extract is applied. Now, you can leave that to ferment. It could be a day. Often, it's up to 30 days, anywhere in between. I mean, some are seven days. I've seen in the literature, some go up to 30, to 30 days. Okay, and you just leave it there to ferment and then you apply. Okay, now you typically should avoid food sources. Again, there's a mixture in the literature, but you should be avoiding food sources here because when you add food sources in a non-aerated tea, 
that of course feeds the organisms, they grow quicker, and sometimes therefore it encourages uh, overstimulation, they grow too quick. Uh, so for non-aerated teas, you, you should really leave the foods out, or, or tiny, tiny amounts, if, if at all. And again, quick and easy to make, small investments, just do an extract and then leave it sit for 30 days. Okay, the negatives, there are some concerns. It is an anaerobic uh, condition. If it goes, does not go into a fermentative direction, it could go into a putrative direction. There is the potential to harbor some pathogens. We could introduce some pathogens through this pathway, but as long as it goes towards a fermentative process, then it's, it's typically okay. And we could steer that by adding things like EM, effective microorganisms, add some of those lactobacillus, uh, lactic acid producing bacteria to ensure it heads off into a fer fermentative direction. That can kind of help overcome that. But there is a risk, so be, you do have to be a little careful with these. Uh, there can be that risk of pathogen introduction. And that's also why it's best to usually avoid manure-based composts. It's better to use a green waste compost if you're going to be uh, making something like this. Okay, and that differs from an aerated compost tea, where, as the name suggests, we add air. We're going to pump, uh, blow, uh, in inject some oxygen, some air into the water to provide oxygen so that we then start to encourage more of an aerobic process, uh, an aerobic brewing. Not really a fermentation, it's more of an aerobic brewing. And those microbes will use the oxygen to multiply. And this is where we then bring foods in, so we can add food sources, and I'll talk about those in a second. And that's the principle. The microbes will use the oxygen to feed on the foods and multiply. And we'll typically leave them for normally about 24 hours, but again, it kind of varies. It can be 18, up to 48, but generally 24 hours is a good time. Um, and let them multiply. And the point of that, the benefit of that, is we can typically then get away with very small amounts of compost, just as a starter inoculum, and then we feed them. And of course, they multiply, multiply, multiply. During that brewing process, they will double their population every 30 odd minutes. And at the end of that 24 hour brew, we will have literally billions and billions of organisms per milliliter. I mean, just vast, vast numbers, uh, which again, then can be applied over the foliage, seed treatment, dribble down into the furrow at planting, however we want to uh, inject some of those uh, microorganisms there. Um, now, the negative, so positive, we need very small amounts of compost. It's only 1%, a kg per 100 litres. That's really not much compost at all. And that'll be applied over a hectare or so. Uh, the negatives, okay, and I'll talk about that as we move forward. We need a bit more specialised gear. There's a bit of a higher investment to, to do the aerated teas. Uh, they do involve more uh, investment and time and effort there. And one of the really important things I have to point out that I think is perhaps missed by a lot of people using the, the compost tea uh, ideas is that really compost tea is best applied onto the foliage as a foliar uh, uh, extract um, to apply those very active organisms over those leaf surfaces. But the compost extract is really better applied down into the soil. Now, you do get a bit of overlap between these two, but the reason being is it comes down to this lovely little image here that you can see I have here. The thing about microbes in the soil, the soil microbiome, most of them are there in the soil. They are completely dormant. They're there, but they're asleep. And they're waiting for plant root exudates, those signaling molecules, those messaging molecules, to be released to wake them up, those on-off switches. And so when the plant releases those signaling molecules, it's turning on certain species. It is recruiting, selecting those certain species. And it is selecting a handful of species from the soil, the bulk soil microbiome, this bank of microbes that exists there, all dormant, and I'm going to recruit a handful of you to come and help me grow at this present moment. So it explains it nicely here. What we then see is that the diversity of microbes in soils, in the bulk soil, is much higher. We have a huge diversity of dormant organisms here. But as we move closer into the rhizosphere, into where all of those root exudates, those on-off switches, are getting released right here, we are in fact just selecting a handful of species. So we're losing diversity as we get in close to the root, into the rhizosphere. Our diversity is lessened, lowered, because the plant is choosing who it wants to recruit. However, the activity of those organisms, as you can see, as we move in closer, is maximal. So we have incredible density, incredible activity around that rhizosphere of those handful of species. 
But as we move away into the bulk soil, of course, the activity of those organisms then declines. Because how far do root exudates migrate from the root system again? Who remembers from yesterday? A millimeter, that's right, a millimeter or two. So, of course, the root exudates don't get out to the bulk soil, so the activity drops right off. Okay, but that's where you have the bank of dormant organisms then waiting to be recruited. Okay, so then the point here is, the reason compost extracts will go down into the soil is because they are more diverse, they have more biodiversity than a compost tea. Because the bio, we've just extracted those organisms from the compost, and we didn't brew them, we just extracted them, didn't we? Whoever was there in the compost, they all came out. And so we have this good diversity. As soon as we start to turn that into a compost tea, we've added some food sources, as I mentioned, and oxygen. And that similarly selects for the species that like those food sources, that like that oxygen, that like that temperature of the water, that like that pH of the water. So we actually select a handful of species that then become highly active. So that's what we're doing in a compost tea. And you want those organisms to be highly active if they're going onto the foliage because only active organisms can provide disease protection. The organism has to be alive to be active, feeding, releasing metabolites, antagonizing pathogens for it to be effective against that pathogen. A dormant organism cannot suppress a pathogen. It cannot suppress if it's asleep. So that's why we want maximum diversity down in the soil and then just let the plant turn on who it wants. And then, however, up here on the foliage, we do want the active organisms to help with that disease protection. Okay, and so that really steers the uh, direction there, and that's where if many people may start with a compost extract, and it's a really good place to start if you're new to this. Uh, it's easier, it's low-tech, etc., and it's a good place to start amongst also conventional farmers who might not want to <coughs> cut back their fungicides yet. You can put compost extracts down around your seed. That's a great place to start, even if you still want to maintain your chemistry on top. You know, that's a great place to start. It's a good compromise. Let's start building up the biological activity in the soil while you're still trying to dial those down on the top. Okay, there's, there's ways, to, way, many roads to roam. So, okay, that's the principle there. Okay, and now well, let's, I'm going to scoot through some of these practical considerations. Um, that is a nice fungal spore there germinating. You can see a nice fungal hyphae there growing in a compost tea. So we're going to talk about brewer design, aeration, hygiene, compost quality, food sources, brewing, application, and hygiene, again, I put that back at the end, hygiene is so, so important, so that's why it's in the list twice. Okay, so brewer design, again, I'm really not fussy, there's high-tech options that can cost you a lot of money if you want to go for those, there's also low-tech options that you can build yourself if you want to go for those, and again, no right or wrong, some people are very happy to get a kit in, some people are happy to do it themselves. And there are the key components, you need some kind of a tank, you need some kind of a pump circulation for that aeration, we may need some kind of a tea bag or some filtration equipment. Uh, and particularly, I'm a big fan of these conical shaped tanks, especially in old milk vats if you've got stainless steel, even better, great for hygiene. Uh, I think those conical shaped tanks are really good. And I, you can't see, that, unfortunately, in this photo because I've got this stand, but this is a nice conical shaped tank coming down here. And I really like this design. I'll compare it to some others as we go forward because uh, we've got a simple air blower here that you can see and uh, you know we simply have a cam fitting here, two inch fan cam fitting and we can hook that up to the bottom of the conical tank. And the, the thing I really like about this design is that everything happens in and out of that one hole at the bottom. So we, you know, we can fill up the tank, then we're just going to blast air through that, a jet of air, and get this really nice rolling ball of jet of, of air being pushed up into that tank for the oxygenation, for the agitation, aeration, etc. And of course the point is, of course you could mount this higher up than the level of the water if you wanted to be a bit safer there. Um, but the point is, you know, once you finish the brewing, okay, close off the valve or the valve up there, you'd have another one up there, close that off, let the tank settle for a few minutes, let all that sediment and things come to the bottom, and then of course we can just open that valve, let that flush of sediment out, uh, just those solid bits of compost and things, they can just be flushed out and then we can drain that down into our sprayer, etc. And so the point is then everything happens in and out of that hole. It's really easy to clean. We can get up the top and just hose it down all out of that hole as well. So I, I really like these designs, but um, they are my preferred from an ease of cleaning, ease of use, practical point of view, minimal bits inside to clean. I'll, show, I'll compare you some others. I'll show you some others in a second. So I really think the conical shape kind of systems are uh, really good uh, from, that, from a tank point of view.
Okay, then we need to think about aeration, and that, okay, that's what that air blower was doing. But whichever way we want to use, uh, the key is to get that oxygen into the water, dissolved oxygen into the water for the entire brewing process. Okay, we want to keep it aerobic during that 24-hour brew process. And remember that the microorganisms are multiplying the whole while. They're doubling their population, doubling their population. And as they're doubling their population, their demand for oxygen is also increasing. So that's why we've got to make sure that we have enough uh, power in the aerator to keep the oxygen at that six, uh, this ideal level here, six milligrams per liter, six parts per million, uh, for the entire brewing process. Make sure that you've got enough horsepower there uh, to keep the oxygen at that, uh, at that level. Okay, and how do, can we do aeration? Okay, it could be those air blowers, as I mentioned. It could be a venturi pump. So it could be very simple circulation, just simply circulating that water. As it passes through that venturi, it's sucking in that, the air there. So that's ideal. That works very well. Uh, or if, if we have any biodynamic farmers in the room, the flow form works exceptionally well at oxygenating uh, water. It's also probably one of my preferred methods, I would have to say, it does the best job at uh, oxygenating that water. So you can use a flow form, uh, this cascading uh, little waterfall there for aeration. Okay, so again, it doesn't have to be too high tech either. But those are your kind of, kind of options. Now here's again an air blower system that um, has these kind of membranes underneath. These are kind of these tubular membranes that have lots of tiny little holes, tiny little slits in there which when we pump the, blow the air in, it creates these nice little mini bubbles that you can see here. And here's another nice example. Here you can see these nice membranes that have lots of tiny little slits and we're creating those nice little mini air bubbles. You'll read a lot online that it says, well, you need small bubbles. Or the small bubbles are the best. That's the best way to get the oxygen content up. I don't totally believe, well, there's nothing wrong with that, it's fine, but I just, you know, the, the picture that I showed you earlier, I've seen excellent oxygen with just a jet of two inch of air being blasted into that, creating a rolling ball. It still oxygenates as well. So, and again, so you can see the benefit. Look at the insides of this tank and all the bits and surfaces that you have to clean versus this one. You know, there's lots of bits of stuff you've got to clean and wipe down and make sure it's hygiene and can get in under there. It's a bit of a pain in the butt. So I'm all about making it as easy and uh, as lazy as possible. So those work well, nothing wrong with them, but I just, I think the other systems are easier, more practical, less time spent cleaning. Which brings us to hygiene. It is really important. Uh, there is a risk with all of these, I should really say, for pathogen introduction. So we do have to be careful, uh, especially with manure-based composts. So I think for any of these, it, it is better to lean towards those green waste composts. There is a potential risk. Now, if we do it properly, if we keep hygiene, if we keep good oxygen, etc., yep, all of those beneficials can outcompete the pathogens, absolutely, in principle, in theory. But nonetheless, we all know accidents can happen. So, okay, it's possible. I have to put that red alert. It is possible. So we do have to be careful. And that's where hygiene is also really important because if we don't clean out the tank, uh, we can leave bits of old compost tea and goop and gunk there that can begin to harbour pathogens or that may be introduced in the next brewing so next time we put a brew on. Okay, so that's why it's not just the brewing tank you have to clean. It's also your pipes, also flush your pumps. Uh, you know, clean everything out. You really want to make sure it's nice and thoroughly clean between batches. Okay, that's a really important point. And that is especially true when we, when we add food sources. Okay, those, the compost extract and the non-aerated tea where we don't add foods, uh, that's also, it's the foods that can particularly be worrying. So just, they're the ones that we want to kind of be a bit careful with. And again, okay, cleaning out everything. Tank pump pipes and the tea bag itself. Okay, what can we use there? It could be a bit of bleach, some chlorinated water, even a bit of hydrogen peroxide can work very well, uh, which of course just breaks down to form uh, hydrogen and water anyway. So just sterilizing the surfaces in between brews is, uh, is a good idea. Okay, then we move into the compost, and of course we could then talk a whole another hour on how to make good quality compost. I don't have time for that today, um, but all I'll say is the point is we want to use as good quality compost as we can. Of course, the better quality the starter inoculum, the more likely the better quality the compost tea or the compost extract will be. Okay, so it just makes sense. Let's get good quality compost. Even better, maybe mix together two or three different sources of compost and use them, because now we're increasing the diversity of different sources and bring them into that tea or that extract to encourage maximum diver uh, diversity. So you really want to go for best quality if you can. 
And okay, I mentioned those rates there before, compost tea, 1%, compost extracts, perhaps around 10%. And again, that's just, those are kind of approximate numbers. People do all sorts of different things uh, in the literature and on farm. People use all sorts of rates, but that's a kind of a good starting point. And that's what it's all about. You know, this is the surface of a nice quality compost. And of course, to us, what, it just looks like some soil, but, you know, the surface, if we scan in, close, zoom in close enough, that surface of that compost is covered in microbial biomass. We can see some nice fungal strands there, uh, little various kind of bacteria here, here, and here, different species of bacteria you can see here, here, here. Uh, this is probably a yeast spore here. So we have all sorts of wonderful microbes and diversity there, which we wash them off into the liquid to then apply out into the field. Okay, so then those food sources that I mentioned, uh, that is an important point. We've got to match the food sources to the population of the microbes there. So if we put too much food in, we can overstimulate them and overgrow them, and then they use the oxygen quicker than they're growing. Uh, not, the oxygen can't keep up with how quickly they're growing. So there are these con considerations, and the typical amount of food that you will use in a brew is around about this 0.1 to 1%. So that's about 100 mils up to a litre, so 100 mils, 500 mils, some people use around half a percent is, is pretty good too, um, per 100 litres of water, it's in that kind of range. Okay, so that's a good starting point to, to kind of shoot for. You don't, really don't want to go any higher than, than 1%, that's definitely, definitely more than enough. Now the food sources that we can use can be, a, again, diversity of food sources is good, so we could use a combination of things like molasses, sugars, uh, fish uh, hydrolysates, etc., seaweed, kelp extracts, fulvic acids, humic acids, uh, plant extracts, plant teas, these kinds of things. I would say, though, I think really be extremely careful with using molasses. I would suggest to be safe and avoid it. Uh, lean towards these other options here. Uh, the thing about molasses is that it's, it is such a powerful bacterial stimulant. It just really encourages bacteria to the extent where they can grow so fast and too much and they kind of outcompete the fungi. So we don't get as much of a nice diverse tea. You get this real dominant of bacterial tea, which is not really what we want. We want kind of more of a balance, maybe even ideally a bit more fungal dominated. So be careful with molasses and molasses has also been shown to encourage E. coli to feed and encourage E. coli. So, you know, it's just better to not include it at all in the brew. You could mix molasses together in the application tank at the time of application. So you could put molasses in at then, but not during the brewing. Just put it in at the time after the brew, at the time of application, uh, throw some molasses in to get a bit of food sources going. Okay, so be careful of that one. So the process there, a protocol for brewing, start by filling your tank with water if you are using uh, chlorinated water, mains water, etc. Uh, you would want to aerate that, turn your pump on and aerate that for at least an hour and that will help the chlorine to uh, vapor off of, of gas. So you want to get that out of the system. Ne next you should add the food sources. They go in next. Uh, dilute, make sure those are fully dilute and add those in, in second. And the reason we do that is, is that those food sources are all carbon compounds. And if you remember my integrated nutrient management slide with that nutrient getting wrapped up in a carbon source, it's the same principle. We're going to add all those carbon sources into the water. If there's any salts, any sodium or any, anything in, that's in that water, that those carbon compounds will bind to it uh, first, you know, in tying those up, immobilizing those. And then last, we add the inoculum, the compost, the microbial product, whatever it might be. Uh, we add the organisms last into that, into that environment. Okay, brewing time. I did discuss this already. I, I really I have to just say, I think, I really just like 24 hours. I just think it's a practical number. Okay, you can go a little less, you can go a little longer, but I just like 24 hours because you can come in... Uh, you can, you know, I was going to say, come into, the, into your brewing room, but you're already on your farm, so you're already at work. You don't have to come into work to, to, to think about this. You're already at work, probably. Um, point is, start the day and look at the forecast for tomorrow. And, okay, the forecast for tw the next 24 hours is usually a little bit more accurate than if we start planning further beyond. So the point being, if it takes about 24 hours, I think that's practical. We've come in, check the forecast for tomorrow. If tomorrow looks good, put a brew on today. And then you'll have a 24-hour brewing cycle. Tomorrow morning, you can, that'll be ready. You can load that into the sprayer uh, and apply that. That's if you're doing foliar sprays. If you're putting it through irrigation, etc., then uh, through fertigation and whatnot, of course, it doesn't matter. But 
I mean, on that point, a little bit of drizzle, a little bit of rainfall is actually quite okay for applying compost teas, uh, that you don't have to have perfectly dry conditions. A little bit of light rain is, is actually quite good for them. So that's quite okay. It's not such a critical issue. But, you know, I just think 24 hours has a pra certain practicality about it in terms of future planning, time plan, time management, etc. So I, I would lean towards, towards that. But as I say, you'll, hear, you'll read different literature online and things, but that's a good point to start. Okay, so what happens uh, when we brew, as I mentioned, we, we drop those microorganisms from the compost, they extract out into the liquid, and then we are multiplying them. So, of course, the, only the species that like that environment, the handful of species that like that temperature, that pH, those food sources, they will typically be the ones that will then dominate. So we have narrowed our diversity, selected the key species uh, that particularly like those conditions. So, and of course, they grow, they feed, they multiply. But they don't just multiply, it's not just about growing the microbial biomass, it's also about the process of the compost tea brew. So whilst they're growing, whilst they're multiplying, whilst they're feeding and reproducing and doing what they do, they're also exuding all of their various byproducts, <coughs> microbial metabolites, waste products, these kinds of things. And so there's all these biochemicals getting exuded into the brew. Now, that means that compost tea is not just about the living organisms that are there, it's also about their metabolites and these antibiotic, antifungal, plant growth promoting compounds that they exude. These are the same compounds they exude all around the root systems and on the leaf surfaces, the ones that are naturally there. They're also exuding them during the brew. So in theory, we could take the brew and uh, sterilize it. We could cook it and kill all the organisms in there. We would still have all of these beneficial bio microbial metabolites in the brew, which can have many plant growth promoting benefits or disease suppressive benefits. That said, in terms of a disease point of view, the evidence is quite clear. You've got to have living organisms. They are the primary uh, method in which these kind of things can suppress pathogens. So it is, I wouldn't, I'm not encouraging you to kill the organisms or to sterilize them. You want the living ones, but I'm just pointing out that they're also exuding all of these compounds during the brew, and those are also there at the end of that brew process when you apply them. Okay? Um, application, fresh is best. Uh, this is um, particularly true with your aerated compost tea where you've added food sources. As soon as you've finished brewing, you really should be applying that straight away. Okay, don't store it, just load it up into the spray tank and off you go. Fresh is best is always the rule. Uh, diaphragm or piston pumps are preferable if you need to use a transfer pump to get it into your spray tank. Uh, centrifugal pumps, which of course have that propeller that spins very fast, can damage the organisms. So more softer, gentler um, piston pump, diaphragm pump is a better way to transfer that tea. Or even better, if you can gravity feed it into your spray tank, that would be even better. Um, you also have to th consider your filtering, um, no finer than 200 micron. If you go lower than that, you start to filter out the organisms. So try and keep it as coarse as possible. You know, work back from your nozzles, try and get some sp more coarse nozzles uh, on your spray, uh, on your sprayer, uh, that, and work back from there. But you want to try and keep it as coarse as possible, certainly no finer than 200 micron. Now, some people will put the compost into the tea bag, hence the name compost tea and immerse that tea bag down into the water during the brewing. And that's quite okay. But as you can imagine, as we fill compost in there, as it gets wet, you know, it does kind of slump down. It does compact a bit. So it gets a bit harder to do a good extraction. You've got to, you've got to wash those organisms off the compost to get them into the solution. So I have to be honest, I do prefer just adding the compost in loose and just letting it all slush around uh, or loose throughout the brew. That makes it a lot messier job, but again, if we have a nice conical shaped tank, as I mentioned, you can turn that off, let all of those sediments settle to the bottom of that cone, and then just uh, collect the first washings into a bucket and then load the rest into the spray tank. You know, or you could draw, you know, let all the sediments settle in the bottom of the conical tank and draw off the top. You know, that's also another way to, to bypass that issue. But I think it's just better you get this really nice extraction throughout the brew uh, rather than putting it into there where that fine mesh can sometimes restrict the extraction of those organisms out. But that said, many people use tea bags. Many people use tea bags with, with success, etc. So again, no, no set rules on this, whatever works for you. I know different people prefer uh, different things. 
Um, spray pressure is another one, uh, less than 60 psi. If the pressure is too high, uh, it can kind of kill the organisms as they pass through the nozzle or as they come out of the nozzle and hit the foliage, they kind of go splat. Is it too much pressure, it's too hard for them. So keeping that as low as possible, certainly less than 60 psi. Um, and as I said, I mean, you know, the application rates really depend on how, again, everyone does different things. Um, but 20, as low as 20 odd litres a hectare in kind of some situations being kind of dribbled down into the furrow with that seed, up to 50, up to 100 litres a hectare. I mean, it's in, it's in this ballpark. Different people do different things. Horticulture is typically going to go higher. Your cereals and things are going to typically go a bit lower just to the, due to those economies there. So um, that's your kind of, you know, application rate. And I have to really echo, um, you know, what Gary mentioned yesterday. I totally agree with this point that it's the seed is your bang for best buck. You know, so so using these as seed treatments or seedling treatments in horticulture, or getting them down into the furrow. The point is to put that little bit of biology, that inoculum, not as I said, not to change the soil microbiome. No, that's the wrong way to be kind of talking about it, thinking about it. It's about a targeted application, a targeted approach around that seed, around that seedling, or right, dribble down into that furrow, just to put that inoculum of organisms there for the plant to recruit on, to call on as it grows and develops. You know, it's just a little starter. It's just a keystone species. It's a little primer just to get things going and help with establishment through the rest of the growing cycle, etc. So, you know, I really have to echo that. I think, you know, focus your efforts on this this kind of day zero, you know, be that as seed treatment or be that at planting, day zero. Like this is where you want to focus your effort to, to, to put some biology in, especially if you're new to it. Okay, as you go along, you might then start to branch out into the foliar, you know, applied the compostees on the foliage, etc. You know, go for it, absolutely. This is a really good and easy place to start. And this is the point that, uh, you know, I kind of really touched on. This is going to be part of this whole kind of quantum leap thing that we're, we're kind of going through with the microbiome research. It's about understanding now that, you know, the soil microbiome is this bank, uh, sorry, I've bumped that now, um, is this bank of organisms and it's a bank of a, a whole big gene pool. And we know that, of course, plants have genes and their various kind of plant varietal genomes. And really, this is what's exciting as, as about this stuff is a bit complex and academic and pie in the sky, a bit it, it sounds at the moment. But this is the point, is that when we couple this thinking, when we bring these three pieces of the puzzle together, that all of these genes in microbes that do all sorts of cool things, all of these genes that plants have that do all sorts of interesting things, and then the messaging molecules right in the middle. This is where we have the communication between the, the soil microgenome and the plant genome, and this is their language. They talk the language, not the language of love, folks, it's the language of root exudates. Um, and their signals acting as signaling molecules, etc. And so this is their language, and this is what we're going to do now with science and technology and all the stuff that Fiona was talking about yesterday. Excellent. We're going to now go and approach plants, microbes, and soils, and plant production and agriculture as we know it, with thinking about these three things and how we're going to line them all up to work for us i.e. make sure that the plants have got the right genes that encode for those root exudates that encourage the nitrogen fixing genes like we saw in the maize example earlier. And now we're going to tailor and design new varieties going forward with this exact kind of trio in mind. And it is, it's super exciting. It really is going to redefine how we do things. That picture I also showed yesterday of the einkorn wheat and the modern wheat and that very different root structures you know, it's along those lines. Just think of what we are going to be able to do when we couple all three of these things together and start breeding with this intentionally in mind. Breeding for these root systems. Breeding for the genes that, uh, that wake up the nitrogen-fixing organisms. Can we cut back our nitrogen inputs? Absolutely we can. But we need the intention and the will to do it. And now we've got the tools. It is a very exciting quantum leap that's coming up. And it's not going to be too, too far away. I mean, there's some really hot stuff will come out of this in the next 10 years. There's going to be some really big things happening for sure. So then what happens? Uh, okay, the microbes, they are applied. They protect the plant. They live around the root system. They live over the leaf surfaces. They live over the stems, over the flowers, over the fruits, all of these new 
spheres that I mentioned earlier. We could colonize the plant surfaces, the phytobiome. They can protect that plant from disease. They can feed the plant. They can drive nutrient cycling, um, provide nitrogen, solubilize phosphorus, et cetera, et cetera. But also the plant will nurture those microbes. It will release those root exudates, those signaling molecules to have a nice conversation to recruit the ones that it requires. And now we also have this emerging kind of concept of inducing resistance that we can use microorganisms, but also other biostimulants, seaweeds and kelps, for example, are very good here, other plant extracts. Uh, all of these things can be these, can act as inducing agents, these compounds that can turn on the plant's immune system and help it fight off disease. And again, it's like this, these kind of coupling this with you know, what I, we were just talking about here. It's like all of these ideas are now converging together and are really going to, to produce some really exciting kind of systems, models of farming, integrating these kind of varieties that have better ways to communicate, better biostimulants and things to induce this resistance, to manage disease, to manage insects as an integrated strategy. And when we start integrating many tools together, that means we can start to dial down our dependency on the pesticides, on that insecticide, on that fungicide, you name it. They'll still be very valuable tools. I think we should keep them. I think many of them are very valuable tools and that's why we want to keep them and not accelerate the development of resistance in our pests, in our diseases, etc. They can be very important and useful rescue remedies. That's why we should keep them there for as long as possible and use all of these other integrated strategies to reduce our dependency on those. And of course, if you're organic, you should be doing that anyway, because you also have very much, very less, lesser tools at your dispense. So, you know, it's, it's very exciting times, I think, going forward. And these are the kinds of things that will happen when we can start to couple uh, science and technology with the understanding of microbiomes. And that's, you know, just for example, under the microscope, this is kind of what we can see before and after an application. We've used a special stain that makes the active ones grow. Uh, so you can see we didn't have as much colonization coverage over that leaf surface. A few bacteria there that are a bit out of focus. And here we have some nice fungal uh, hyphae that have um, uh, now colonized that post application. And I'll leave you with um, <clears throat> one quick example. And a point about um, some really, again, kind of interesting stuff, where things are going. This was, I won't read it out, but this was a study that was looking at the flowering time of plants. And this, the treatment was very simple. They applied some different microbiomes, some different microbial consortiums to the same variety. You know, same growing conditions, same, same trial, same plants. Here's a, here's a consortium of microbes. Here's a different one. Here's a different one. And what they found is that the microbes, the microbiome, can absolutely influence the plant expression. And they were look, studying flowering time in this, in this particular example. So, you know, here we are, we've been breeding all of these many past decades, you know, looking at flowering time, if that's what maybe what we were breeding for. We were looking at the flowering time and we were breeding, ah, this one's good, let's choose that one. This one's good, let's choose that one. We've been doing this without ever thinking about the soil microbiome. And what this study has shown is that, that, flat, that the microbiome can totally change the flowering time, that it is a key regulator, a controller of that flowering time. And that's what the experimental design proved. So it highlights this really important question, this highlights this really important point, which is, well, that means when we've been selecting and breeding for the past many decades at our research stations, uh, at our tr et cetera, where our breeding stations, well, those plants have been expressing those traits in those soils with that microbiome. And now we know that microbiomes totally control the expression of the plant, the flowering time, or the disease resistance, or whatever the trait was that was being selected for. Now you take that same plant and put it into your soil with a different microbiome. We now know that, therefore, if you don't have the right microbiome, you don't have the right trait you don't have the right expression of that trait. So you see there's a big problem there. Now we have this idea we should go back to pure seed and buy seed each year and have true stock. Well, if you don't have the right microbiome, folks, you're not even going to be getting those benefits. So that's a big problem. We need to be saving seed ourselves because then you're selecting for the seeds and the expression of the right genes based on your microbiome in your soil. 
and you do that generation, another generation, another generation, you will begin to fine tune the expression of the genes in that seed according to your own microbiome. And that's why seed saving is so important. And it says something else. If microbes can control the expression of the plant, what about microbes in our stomach? Can they also control the expression of the human? They sure do. And again, this comes back to we are what we eat and diet. We know that the microbiome controls all sorts of processes in our bodies. Gut-brain access, how we think, how we feel. So if we can change the expression of the human, of course, therefore, through our food, through our diet, we can change the expression of our society, of our culture, how we interact. I mean, it's big stuff, and it's very, very exciting. Okay, in summary, designing farm systems to support the native soil organisms is absolutely priority. Let's just get some soil health and good practices in. Let's help encourage the native ones, for sure. But compost teas, compost extracts, other microbials, etc., yeah, they may be an ideal tool, as a tool in the toolkit, to kickstart, to reintroduce, to just get things fired up under certain critical or difficult stages or key times in the rotation, etc. Uh, there's still much to learn, though, absolutely, but the new and emerging microbiome um, and analytical tools will absolutely help us uh, through this uh, quantum leap. So I think that's a very exciting time going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you.